We're in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, you know, we, we actually started this last August of last year, and uh, it has been such a blessing to literally walk through the Gospel line by line. I'm so grateful to be led by the Spirit to teach in an expository way. It is really the only way to walk through the gospel. Uh, what blew my mind last night is praying over this message is that we are literally still, still in the last week of Jesus' life on earth. It seems like we've been there a long time, but it's a blessing. I want to I wanna also, I want to mention that, that um, immediately after service, we're going to have a wedding celebration, and I was able to honor to officiate a, a private ceremony uh, Tuesday. And we're going we're gonna to celebrate that right after. Amen. So if you saw the cupcakes and cakes, it wasn't for breakfast. Um, it's for the, for the reception. So let me pray for this message and let's get started. We got a lot of good scripture to go through. So Lord, Father, God, we thank you. We praise you. Lord, Father, you're a good, good father. Yeah. We thank you for the good word, the eternal word. Lord, no matter how much changes in the daily life on this planet, the one thing that has always, does always, and will always remain the same is your word. Amen. Amen. I thank you for this message. I pray that only the words you allow me to say are the words that are spoken. I pray that the hearts are ready to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the one thing the Lord gave me, and we stick to one thing, is that people seeking conflict over Christ are usually just seeking the comfort of Christ. When people confront you, become adversarial against you, they are truly seeking comfort in their life. They do not realize that you've got the answer. Or maybe they do, which is why they are confrontational. You know, it's important to understand this because it's easy to get locked into defending Jesus instead of loving the combative person. But the truth of the word is like a lion. It doesn't need defending. Just set it free. And the truth will defend itself. So the truth is our anchor scripture. If we can stand together as the body, we stand together, we read this word together, because it is what brings us together as one body. And it comes from Mark 12, 28, 34. It's the scribes, which is the first commandment of all. So let's read together as the body. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. That's a good word. Oh, let's keep going. That's Lanyap. See, down in Bayou, like Bayou Land of South Louisiana, the extra is called Lanyap. So let's keep going. <laughs> there is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no one but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all those burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Mm. Amen. Now that's an even better word. Oh, that's some land you have scripture. Extra scripture is always good scripture. So let's walk through this. I just want to, I want to set the tone once again. If you recall, Jesus has been in the temple and he has been confronted by, by group after group after group. And what they've got to do, they've already set in their mind that they've got to kill him. They've got to stop. They've got to put an end to it. But they also know the powers that be, that he's got the, he's got the heart of the people. He's got the attention of the people. So just recall, now we're, we're in our next phase of attack. So let's go to Mark 12, 28. Then, then, that's a key word, one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceived he had answered them well, and he asked them, which is the first commandment of all? What I want to, what I want to make sure, I want you, I keep encouraging you guys, when you read Scripture, look at it as an investigator. 
Look at context analysis. Then, then means what? Who's up? Who's next? You see, Jesus had already dispatched the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He even had a go with the Herodians and the Sanhedrin council. They were the ones orchestrating everything. But then, then comes the scribes. Like Jesus is probably like, man, is that enough? Not yet. So who are the characters? Who are the scribes? It's very important that we understand the characters at play so we understand the game. See, the scribes actually started off, we know the word scribe. The word scribe, it means it's someone who writes, someone who takes notes. And that's where they began. They began as the note takers. Now, because they were able to record the spoken words, they eventually began to read those words. And they were able to gain knowledge based upon those words that they were able to read and write. That's why education is important. And then they rose up to become religious scholars. But the reality of it was they weren't social influencers or anything like that. They, they're basically what they are today. They're like the trolls on social media. You post something about God and they're waiting to attack you. It doesn't mean they've got any clout or any standing or really even understanding. I just want you to be aware. The same characters that were attacking Jesus then are the same trolls that are attacking us today. Nothing changes. So what are, when it says that the scribes came, the scribes came, in the Greek, that word is so important, came to. It means come to, approach, draw near spiritually. Draw near spiritually. You see, if you remember, every one of these religious elites who came to Jesus at this time of testing in the temple, Jesus didn't come to them. He didn't send them a little calendar invite. They came before King Jesus. I will tell you, they probably never came before anybody in their life. Yet here's the king, and they all come to Jesus. Whether or not they know what they're doing, they are doing what we're all going to do. We will all come before the king. Mark 12, 28 continues. And having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well. This scribe, when it says heard them, well, who's the then? Remember last week, we were talking, uh, two weeks ago, it was the Sadducees. Remember, they concocted this great scenario about, about marriage and the resurrection. And they were going to trip Jesus up. If y'all remember that, one sister, she wound up marrying seven brothers. And Jesus answered them correctly that there will be no marriage in the resurrection. There's only one wedding, and that's with us and the, and the groom. You see, Jesus, the attacks have been relentless and relentless. So I want to walk you through the way that he, he responded and that the way that we're called to respond. Uh, Mark 12, 28 continues. Asked him, and the scribe asked him, which is the first commandment of all? You see, these words are so important to understand, to dig in to what's really being asked. As an investigator, you learn not just to hear what's said, but how it's said, why it's said, the way the person responds when they're saying what they're saying. When this scribe asked him, the Greek word for asked is eparato. And it means in the Greek to interrogate or to question. But you go to the Hebrew, it also means to seek after, to desire an acquaintance with God. You see, this, this scribe right now is kind of double-minded. He's doing the duty that the world put him up to. You go in there and you trip up, old Jesus. But he's heard him answering the truth of the word before. He's watched him bat down every one of these attacks from the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and the Sanhedrin council. And now it's his time to step up. And what he probably woke up that morning with fresh pressed garb and, and thought, I'm going to get him today. As he stood there listening to the true holy word of the Lord, his heart began to, began to flutter a little bit. He wasn't as much combative as he was curious. So when he asked that word, the word asked does mean to interrogate, to question. But more importantly, it means that he is seeking a desire for an acquaintance with God. You see, the scribe purposely asked Jesus, because he was at a time of confliction. What I want to share with you is an equipping moment. When you're sharing your gospel witness, we know that the, that the devil's overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony. Share the word of the Lord. Even someone who may appear 
combative and uninterested. That word of truth will begin to, to, to resonate, to transform their minds. Do not be afraid based on appearances or perceptions to share the word of the Lord. Even the hardest hearts have been softened. I know I can testify to that, and I know a lot of us can all testify. Some of the hardest hearts have been softened by the word of the Lord, and those hearts were once ours. What I will tell you is an equipping moment, because we're an equipping church. Even when people try to disprove God, they're actually in search of a reason why they cannot accept Him as who He says He is. You see, we're pre-programmed with a desire to know the Creator. Most, most atheists will testify, former atheists, that they came to Christ while they were trying to prove that He doesn't exist. Again, I want to remind you, church, do not give up on witnessing to people because they don't respond the way you expect. Plant seeds of what they're truly seeking, God's Word. So the, so the scribe, he asked, what is the first commandment or foremost commandment? In the Greek, the word is protos, protos, prototype. It is what is the first, what is the best? See, the scribe's not asking him for a chronological listing of the commandments. Jesus could pull out his little, his little iPhone, he'd go to his Bible app, and he could go to Exodus, he'd go to Deuteronomy, he could read them off chronologically. This is not what the scribe's asking him. What is the most important, what is the protos, the most important commandment? You see, what this guy's trying to do is Moses is the main man. These, these Jews, they love Moses, and rightfully so. And, and the, the elites, they've heard Jesus say some things that, that weren't what they were used to hearing or the way they were used to hearing it. So they're like, you know what? If I can get Jesus to misspeak against Moses or to contradict Moses, man, this crowd, this crowd who a couple days earlier were screaming, Hosanna, this crowd will turn against him. Because if he goes against Moses, they're going to go against him. So the scribe thought that he had a good strategy. And I will tell you what, it wasn't a bad strategy. Because I will tell you, no one in the Torah, if you recall the Torah, or the first five books of the Bible, the Mosaic Law, the Pentateuch in the Greek, Pente meaning five. No one in the Torah had encountered a relationship with God like Moses. He was the only man that Scripture says spoke with God face to face. Exodus 33, 11 says, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. Isn't that amazing? And you know, I was praying last night, and the Lord said, You know what's even more amazing? Is at the time, this was correct. No one had. Now, let me, let me qualify this. So when it says face to face, Exodus 33, 20 tells us, uh, God tells Moses, You cannot see my face, for no one sees me and lives. So, I don't want you to mistake thinking they're face-to-face -face talking. It's an intimacy level, like a man talks to a friend. You know who has that same relationship today? We do. We do. We have the 100% righteousness of God through the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We have an intimate opportunity to go to the Lord face-to-face -face every moment of every day. And when the resurrection comes, we will be in the presence of the Lord. But at the time, Moses was the only person that Scripture declares had that relationship. So if Jesus even hinted, like dropped just a little bit of shade on Moses, the public opinion would have turned. And now they could have easily moved towards an arrest and a trial and a prosecution. But do you see the irony of the world's reasoning when they go against Jesus or they go against you for sharing on, on social media or sharing your faith? This is the irony. Like, remember, Jesus is a Jew. Jesus is Jewish. And they want to accuse a Jew of being anti-Jew. This is the way the world reasons. How about going something with, well, he's heretical. Or it's heresy what he's saying. No, no, they're going to say, oh, he's, uh, he's, you know, he's anti-Jew. This is what the world's trying to do to you. They're trying to confuse you with language and demonic warfare through word fair. Don't get caught up in that nonsense. Stick to the word of the Lord. Yes, amen. Jesus did not send you here to win arguments. He sent you here to win souls. So how's Jesus going to reply to the scribe? 
Probably a better question I should ask is how would you have replied to the scribe? And because this is a mature, equipped church, I know how you'd reply. You'd reply the way Jesus did. Perfect. What he's going to do is he's going to quote Moses, their main man. You see, every Jew knew these scriptures because they had to quote them. They had to know them as part of Moses' teaching on the law. So let's go to Mark 12, 29, 30. And Jesus answered him, The first of all these commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Not the first chronological commandment. This is the protos, the most important. You see, instead of Jesus also, which is significant, instead of Jesus quoting the commandment from Exodus after Israel's escape from captivity, Jesus quotes the commandment from Deuteronomy, which was in preparation for the Israelites coming into their land of promise. Why? Because God's people were ready, being prepared to move into their time of promise with this crucifixion, resurrection, and the ascension of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus purposely chooses Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Do you notice that Jesus is not answering with his opinion, with his emotion? He's not all up in his feels. He's sticking to the word of the Lord. I encourage you to do the same thing. If we allow ourselves to be emotion-led, your soul, soul soul-led, you're going to ride that roller coaster. But if you allow yourself to be spirit-led, you go to the straight of the line. Stick to the word of the Lord. People don't need your opinion. They need the transformational word of God. So by quoting Deuteronomy 6, what I will tell you is Jesus now, like Moses when he was teaching the Ten Commandments, were preparing God's people for a new chapter in life. Would you say the day of Pentecost was a new chapter in their life? Would you say the day you received Jesus Christ and were water baptized and then baptized by the power of the Holy Spirit, would you say that was a new chapter in your life? They were also emphasizing relationship over rules. What Jesus was saying, he was not saying, I came to abolish the laws. I came to fulfill the law. But I want to share, relationship is more important than Levitical law. Jesus has come to emphasize relationship over rules. And what Jesus is doing is the same thing Moses was doing before they went into the promised land. You remember Moses told him it's so important that you remember these laws. It's called the phylactery. And it was a wooden box that they strapped to their arm and they strapped to their head that had the Torah in that box. That's how important this word is for them to know. This is how important this word is for you to know. I will tell you that you've got a phylactery. It is your phone. It is your Bible. You should always have the word of the Lord with you so you will never forget this eternal holy word. What Jesus is doing, like Moses did, he's introducing them to a new covenant, a new promise, a new testament, a salvation grounded in God's enduring love. This is the most important commandment, the protos. So we ask, what's love got to do with it? What's love got to do with it? Well, let me tell you something. When Lee and I first met, we got very, very different personalities. Anybody that's known us for more than a half a minute knows that Lee and I have very different personalities. So while we were getting to know each other, and and I'll tell you the truth, naturally, I did not know how to love her. You see, I would ask her, I'd invite her to the gym, and I'd offer her chocolate, pieces of chocolate cake, and she'd like, no, I don't want to go there, and I don't want to eat that. And no matter how many times I offered, she said, no, she don't want to do that stuff. Like, what good would it do for me to insist that she receive love on my terms? You're going to eat some chocolate cake. You're going to come to the gym. That's insanity. But you know what we do? That's what we do to God. We insist that he receive our love on our terms. You know how I learned to love my wife the way she wants to be loved? Y'all want, look. I'm going to say it for the right side. I'm going to come on the left side. Y'all know how I learned to love my wife the way my wife wants to be loved? 
I asked her. Y'all want to know how I learned to love my wife the way my wife wants to be loved? I asked her. I appreciate that. Woo! This is going to be a good night to Severi House tonight. Equipping moment. Equipping moment. I want to tell you, Western Christianity, they misguide people. Let me say, weak Western Christianity. They misguide people by saying, all you got to do is love. All you got to do is love. Love the one you're with. But they fail to teach the body how to love. The church does not understand what it requires to truly love a holy God. We think it begins and it sustains with a feeling. Oh, Jesus all warm and cozy. But when those feelings fade, so is your relationship with God. Church, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. Jesus is not your boyfriend. Jesus is not your boyfriend. He is a holy God to be reverenced. Loving and worshiping the sovereign holy God is not based upon how you feel or what He's done for you lately. Like love for God and loving puppies is not the same thing. Then how are we supposed to love God? Here we go again. Hey, y'all. Ask Him. I know Mikey knows the answer already. How are we supposed to know how to love God? Ask Him. Let me tell you something. We don't even have to ask. It's already in the book. Deuteronomy 10, 13, uh, 10, 12, 13. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? How do we love God? How does God want to be loved? Well, let me tell you. He requires only that you fear the Lord your God, live in a way that pleases Him, love Him and serve Him with all your heart and all your soul. And you must always obey the Lord's commandments and decrees that I'm giving to you for your own good. Amen. For your own good. Like I learned for my own good to be good and live in that good is to love my wife the way my wife wants to be loved. It's the same thing for you. It's the same thing for the Lord. So God tells us how to love Him. I will tell you that teaching a watered-down Word of God, it might draw people into the building, but it does nothing to turn them away from hell. We are in perilous times. We have got to stop receiving the watered-down, tickling gospel of Christ. It is not even the gospel of Christ. It is another gospel, and it's not the gospel of Christ. Holy God demands righteous worship. Paul warns us what's going to happen when we reject the Scriptures. When you reject what the Scriptures say about loving God, and instead you choose to do it the world's way, when you're more focused on phone parties and cafe lattes and funny, funny stories, when you walk out of a church knowing more about the pastor's uh, um, fishing habits and fun days in the old days than you do about the reverend God and the Lord, that is not church. That is entertainment. That's good. And let me tell you what happens with entertainment. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says, the Holy Spirit says, in the latter times which we are in, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Anyone preaching anything than the gospel message of Jesus Christ is teaching you a doctrine of demons. Ah, come on. Come on. Amen. Amen. So Jesus... And Moses, they're going to remove the guesswork for you. This is how to love God in four easy steps, according to God. Deuteronomy 12.10, remember. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? They're asking the question, how do we love God the way God wants to be loved? Well, let's go. Deuteronomy 10.12. But to fear the Lord your God. Let me break it down to you. Loving God does not start with what? Love. You're like, what are you talking about? I don't understand. I'm confused now. Let me tell you, it begins with fear. It begins with fear. The Greek word for fear is phobos. Our English word, phobia. Now, it does mean afraid, scared. If you're living outside the will of the Lord, you need to be afraid. You need to be scared. But let me tell you what it means. It means reverent awe 
deep respect, profound honor for God's power, authority, and holiness. Like you cannot come to know God until you first fear God. Otherwise, Jesus is just your boyfriend. You see, there's a relationship between fear and love. Recognizing God's power and holiness, it's got to precede the love of God. Reverent fear, it leads you into a deeper understanding of His love and His grace. That reverent fear, that respect, that's what opens your heart to His love. Let me give you some examples from Scripture. From Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Think about dating your, um, dating your spouse. You know, oh, love at first sight. Love it. Is that love? No, that's attraction. As you get to, to understand your spouse, as you get to, to uh, learn more about your spouse, there, become, there comes a respect. And then there's a fear, because you don't want to fear messing it up, because now you understand them and you respect them. That's when love begins. That's when agape love begins. Agape love is not the way you love puppies. Agape love is not physical attraction. Ecclesiastes 12, uh, 12 13 tells us, let us hear uh, the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. People, I don't know what God wants me to do in my life. I don't know the purpose of life. Let me tell you what. You want to know? Fear God and do what he tells you to do. You will see the fulfilled manifestation of God's will in your life. You're like, I don't know. I'm a kind of independent flower. I kind of want to do things my own way. You know what? This ain't Burger King. You can't have it your way. God is a kingdom. There's a kingdom of heaven. There's structure. There's laws. There's laws. There's rules. And you're like, well, that don't sound like no fun. Where's the creativity come from being stuck in structure? Well, you know what? When our kids were little and all your kids were little, your, your doors were locked, your windows were locked, you got a fence around your backyard, your place is, is secure. There's structure. And now you tell the kitties when all the, the electrical outlets got the cover, y'all go play and have fun. Now they're free to have fun. Now they're free to roam about the house. But you got to have structure. you got to have order. You see, Psalms 147, 11 tells us, The Lord takes pleasure in those who fear Him. In those who hope in His mercy. He takes pleasure in those who fear Him. In those who reverence Him. Those who respect Him. This is who the Lord takes pleasure in. Not those who are fast and loose with the name of the Lord. Those who, who, who mistake good production music for, in the Spirit of the Lord. Fear of the Lord precedes the love of God. Step two, how to love God according to God. Deuteronomy 10, 12. To walk in all his ways. It's simple. Do what God says to do. It is that simple. Our brothers and sisters that have been in the military and and, and first responders, when you go to boot camp or you you go to the academy, you want to get out, you do what they tell you to do. And you get out better than you went in. Not because you're a machine or you're a robot, because you learn order, you you learn structure. This is what God wants you to do, to love God the way he wants to be loved. Now, it says, walk in his ways. Remember the word ways? We've talked about this. In the Greek, it's hodos, the way, the path, the route. It also means uh, the system of doctrine, a belief in the Christian life. Do you guys know what the early church was actually called? The way. The way, the hodos, the doctrine of belief, the one way to the Father through Jesus Christ. Let me give an equipping moment. I'm going to drink a little water because I think maybe somebody get offended. Why is it important to be grounded in God's Word? Why is it so important to be grounded in God's Word? Why is Romans 12, 2 so important? To do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but to renew your mind daily. How do you renew it? By the reading of the Word. Well, let me ask you a question. Let's say this year, 2024, uh, somebody bought you a ticket to Singapore. And you're walking through the streets of Singapore, and you're like, hey, I'm in Singapore. It's 2024. Oh, there's the Pope, and he's going to give a speech. And you hear the Pope say, all religions are a path to God. Let me ask you something. How do you feel about that statement? How do you feel about that statement? Well, you know what? Maybe you'd agree, because it sounds religious from a religious man. And say, you know what? All those religions should coexist. We should have peace so we can all get to heaven. He's right. 
Do you realize that, that, that Satanism is a religion? Should we coexist with evil? Should we coexist with darkness? Should we coexist with sin? But you know what? If you're not grounded in all the ways, you might hear that and go, man, that, that, that old boy's right. And then you call your friends and go, whoo, he was right. Those are doctrines of demons. Right. Or let me tell you, let me, let me do this. This is what our church would do because I know the body that we've equipped. Maybe you've spent your time renewing your mind daily with God's word. And you know the truth about the hodos, the way, the path. Because I guarantee you, we all know there's only one way, there's only one path to God the Father. John 14, 6 tells us, and Jesus said to him, this is Jesus saying to him, open up your family Bible, knock the dust off, look at the big font red letters, and it's going to have this statement in it. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the way, the hodos, the truth, the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. Not through all religions. Not through puppy love. Not through sweet emotions. It is only through Jesus Christ. Step three. Let me push this up. I want to be a good steward of time. Step three. How to love God according to God. Deuteronomy 10, 12 continues. And to love Him. All that the world calls love is not God's love. I will tell you. It's just like saying, well, all water is drinking water. Well, if that's the case, drink out of the toilet. And let me know how it comes out. All love is not God's love. You cannot love a holy God on how you love others in the world. Amen. Amen. I will tell you, the love for God is not the same way that you love your cash or your cat or your car or your coffee. I challenge y'all, be careful using the word love. Make it special. See, this is why Moses and now Jesus are emphasizing to love God how God wants to be loved. It's unfair if all the church tells you is, y'all love Jesus. Y'all go love Jesus. And you know what? Your whole life you grew up in an abusive relationship. That love, that the only love you ever knew in your life was a performance-based love or a manipulative love or a hurtful love. And all the church tells you is, go love Jesus and love one another. So what are you going to do? All you do is what you know. You go off and you, and you hurt people. You hurt yourself. But Jesus and Moses, through the word of the Lord, are telling us this is what love is. This is agape love. This is selfless, sacrificial, unconditional. It is not based on emotions alone. But it's demonstrated through your action and commitment. And look, y'all, this is easy to do. I look at stuff on social media, it's like, 10 hacks to improve your health. I'm like, <laughs> I can't do all that. This, we can do. Amen. So step four, how to love God according to love. Deuteronomy 10, 12 continues. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. This is what he's asking you to do. Give everything you got to the Lord. I'm telling you, whether it's, whether it's worshiping or serving or tithing, Tithe means 10. Tenth. It don't mean 3% or 4%. You can't negotiate the meaning of the word tithe. Amen. So when it says give everything, your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, and apply it to your daily application. Let your first fruit be given to the Lord. Let your first words in the morning be, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Give your first fruit, your first words to the Lord. Even in tithing, it don't mean give him 9% and be like, I checked the box. You didn't. You didn't do what the Lord's asked you to do. So I will tell you, let me go down a little bit. Your love of God cannot just be what he's saying is an outward appearance. It has got to permeate every aspect of a person's life. That love has got to be set into motion. So then what's next? Mark 12, 31. And the, and the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So what I will tell you is when the word like in the Greek is homios, 
What it means is similar in appearance, equal in force, equal in power. So when Jesus says, and the second co commandment is like the first, it's a comparative analysis, meaning they compare. They're equal. They're homeos. Same force, same power. You cannot love God and hate people. It's that simple. You cannot love God and hate people. Why did Jesus add the second part when the scribe only asked which was the foremost, the protos, the first the most important? Well, first off, Jesus is not bound by, by man. He is free to share God's word despite the natural limitations set by man. Church, I will tell you the same thing. You are not bound by man. You are free to share the supernatural, transformative word of the Lord. Second, Jesus emphasizes that true love for God must, must be accompanied by a corresponding love for one's neighbor. It must be. Like both are equally important and inseparable. Demonstrating that loving God extends to loving others, and loving others is an extension of loving God. It's just like fruit. Uh, faith without works is dead. Your works doesn't mean you've got faith, but if you've got faith, it should sure manifest itself in works. Amen. If you truly love God, you cannot hate other people. And I don't mean like, like making crosses over their pictures or, or scratches. On, even, even refusing to forgive someone. It, right refusing to forgive someone Amen. is not loving them the way the Father loves us. And I want to make sure when Jesus says, when Jesus says, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus did not say, love yourself. He did not say, love yourself. Becoming a lover of yourself is actually a sign it's a sign of the end times. I share with you, I get asked all the time, are we in the end times? Yeah! Right now. Every second that passes is one second closer. We're in towards the end times. And if you're a believer, you receive Jesus Christ, you should celebrate the end times. What a glorious day that's going to be. So, so people are like, well, I don't even really know what's going on. Why is everything so coded in the Bible? It's not. You've kept that veil in front of your eyes because you refuse to allow your mind to be transformed by the reading of the Word. Yes. What I will tell you is a lover of self, because I don't want you to confuse with what Jesus says the second most and equal to the first commandment. 2 Timothy 3, 1, 2 tells us, perilous times and perilous men. But know this, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Do you think we're in perilous times? We're getting there. We're getting there. For men will be lovers of what? Themselves. Now, I don't want to be accused of being sexist. When he says men, he's talking Adam, Anthropos, humanity. He's talking about the only two genders that there are, male and female. So, ladies, you're not off the hook. For men, women, will become lovers of themselves. This is a sign of the last days. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, Unthankful, unholy. Do you believe that we're in the last days? Amen. I do too. Keep your focus on Christ. Amen. Keep your focus on Christ. Amen. So let me, let me wrap this up. I'm moving towards the end. I know Kurt likes to make his way up. Did, did Jesus convert this scribe? Well, if you read 12, 32, 33. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to miss Remember, reading the scripture, be an investigator of what's said, why it's said, who says it. You see, the, the, script, the scribe, they are bound to the written word of the Lord. They did not believe in revelation. They did not believe in revelation. If it ain't written, it ain't real. Yet, I want you to catch this, yet he mirrors Jesus' reply when Jesus added from Mark 12, 33, and with all the strength. Do you see what's happening? The world, the demonic world, they sent in an enemy. And Jesus is making an ally. Before we came to Christ, we were all enemies. 
We were all raging against the wind, raging against the world, raging against believers who we didn't understand. And with the compassionate heart of a father and the eternal truth of the word of the Lord, we came to be an ally. We came to be a co-heir with King Jesus. We became part of a royal priesthood. We all became ministers. You see, even when people want to attack your witness, they understand the power and the truth of God's word. Not your opinion, not your argumentative skills. I will tell you, like my spiritual father told me, he used to think he had the spiritual gift of criticism. I thought I had the spiritual gift of out-arguing everybody. Church, that is not a spiritual gift. So I will tell you, Mark 12, 34 says, Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. Despite being under attack all day from the Sanhedrins and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians and now the scribes, Jesus remained under control. He responded with the truth of God's word to deflate the outrageous allegations made against him. When Jesus said, you're not far from the kingdom of God, he is encouraging his brother to gain the full truth of the gospel message. And to wrap into finally in Mark 12, 24, but after that, no one dared question him. In the, in the word dare in the Greek, it's taumeo. It is to be bold. It is to be courageous. Like in, I mean, we used to work the streets. We said, he took your courage. They took your courage. What Jesus did with the compassionate word of the eternal Lord, he took their courage. He took their taumeo. What you'll find is when, when one domino falls, they all tend to tumble. When one domino falls, they all tend to tumble. That's why I always post that quote of 93% of the time, when dad comes to Christ, the rest of the family follows. Let me encourage. I thank you men for leading your families here. I thank you men for being the God-ordained, gender-assigned, spiritual head of your families. I am so thankful for a church where men receive that mantle. What I encourage you men is to share that testimony with other men. Don posts all the time. Mm, Ain't no man should be on the couch on a Sunday morning. There's no such thing as sleeping in, taking a break, chilling out. You encourage your brothers with the compassionate word of the Lord, the heart of the Father, and the eternal word. Not your opinion, not your criticism. Men, I want to encourage you. You carry that mantle well. I want you to shine that light into the kingdom. You see, by keeping his kingdom composure, Jesus revealed God through the truth of the word. Jesus came to win souls, not arguments. We have the same mission. Love God and love people. So the one thing that the Lord put on my heart is people seeking conflict over Christ are usually just seeking the comfort of Christ. So if we can pray, and I'll, and I'll pray this out, I want to remind you that immediately following this, we're going to celebrate the marriage. And I'm not told the couple, because I think it's kind of a cool surprise if you had not met them yet. But immediately following this, we're going, to, we're going to move into a celebration of that marriage. But if you will stand together as a body, let me, to, let me to pray this out. And I do, I want to invite... I want to make this call. We never ever overlook the opportunity to come to salvation in Jesus Christ. But if you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, then I want to tell you, everything that we're teaching does not apply to you. You are not in the covenant. You are not in the covenant that Jesus Christ came to establish. You've got to receive Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the hodos. He's the way, he's the path, he's the route. If you've not received Jesus Christ, I invite you to come up to make a public profession of faith. If you're not, if you're not into that stuff... Got an elder up here? Meet us after service. Hmm. Lord, Father, we thank you. Lord, we praise you. Hmm. Lord, we are so, so thankful. Thank you, Father God, for, for, not, for not leaving us like, like teenagers trying to, trying to date their first girlfriend, just messing up and bumbling and stumbling relationships. Thank you, Father God, for giving us an eternal word. Yeah on how to love you the way that you demand to be loved, the way you deserve to be loved. It is a holy, reverent, 
all in love. Lord, I pray that the body received this message. I pray that we, we receive this word, that the Holy Spirit impacts it upon our spirit. I pray that we, we go forward understanding that it's not a puppy love, that we're not just to be nice to other people, but we're to show them the compassionate heart of God the Father. Mm. Lord, we're in a special time. We're in a special time, Lord. We know this. We know that we're moving into the perilous days. But I know we ain't seen nothing yet. Lord, thank you for rising up and equipping church that's been called to Ephesians 4, 11, 12 to equip the saints to do the, do the ministry, to edify the body and go out and do ministry, Father God. I thank you for calling this church to build a warrior culture who are not afraid to swing the sword of the word. In that, Father, I praise you for a for a body that has the compassionate heart of God the Father. So Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you with our words and our actions. Lord, we go all in for King Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord.